uh, and therein I request her. And, and therein I request her to uh, begin with the technical session. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, I must begin with thanks to Dipen and his colleagues for having asked me to speak to the participants today. Well, I must begin with a very clear statement about the fact that uh, these workshops uh, are generally aimed at enhancing the capacity of the college teachers and research scholars to do their work better. But now I must tell you at the beginning that when uh, these people request me to give MCQ questions to, on the lectures, I find a little difficult. The, the reason is very simple. That in social sciences, there's hardly anything which can be said in terms of yes and no. There's hardly any question of any substance or quality which to which a definite answer is there in social sciences. Everything is qualitative and relative in social sciences. We must remember that. Unless you ask very trivial things like the number of a particular article or name of the author of a particular book, the year in which a particular declaration was made, these are the things you know, which are very elementary. And I expect people who sit for class 10 examination to answer that kind of questions. In fact, when this was originally proposed to the University Grants Commission to start MCQ questions even for other exams, we were opposing it because while in some of the natural sciences it could be possible, in social sciences it is virtually impossible to find one answer for most important questions. Most important questions. Unless you decide to ignore the doubts about answers which are generally accepted. That is why, but despite that, I have decided that that's why you'll see that I have given facts you know, in this lecture, which I would have just left you to uh, look up yourself. There's another small thing I must tell you, that as a student of MA class in 1968, my best teacher, Professor Satishar, who has come from Oxford, taught us something very interesting. He said, song on, song on. What is that? No, uh, I'm requesting all the participants to kindly mute their mics. Mute your mics. Uh, you know, he told us very clearly that for those who have done an MA uh, or are pursuing research, for them, what is there in the books is not very important for us to teach because they can go and read the books. What is not there in the books, meaning an interpretation of what is said in a particular book or in a particular research paper, the interpretation of that, criticism of that needs to be uh, conveyed to them. You should open their eyes to interpretations. That is what is important for teachers or teachers at the university level who are doing their, the two students who are doing their MA or when I speak, to a group like yours, college teachers. But, and that is why, normally I do not mention very, unless it is very, very important facts. Facts I take for granted, people can go and look up books, look up dictionaries, look up uh, resource materials, and you can find facts. But it is important to understand how to interpret those facts. And if there is already an interpretation, how to critique that interpretation. See, the task of a college teacher or a university teacher or a researcher is to challenge what is there in their front. Try and see that it is whether it is wrong. Only when they are convinced, they should accept that. With this, let me begin with this particular uh, session. And I've been asked to speak on the human rights of the marginalized communities. Well, as you will see, that this idea of the community, marginalized community, is a little problematic. I'll come to that in a few minutes. But if you look at any country in the world, you'll find some groups which confront barriers that prevent them from fully participating in 
political, economic, and social life. Such people are discriminated against or disabled by society. They are generally poor, uneducated, or less educated, and without access to power. Being excluded from economic, social, political means of realizing one's potential can adversely affect groups of people. This is a very, very uh, difficult thing. When you see any society in the world, you'll find this situation. Some people are disabled in various ways. And these are people whom I would call marginalized. When you look at India, the part three of the Constitution of India guarantees fundamental rights to all citizens of the country. Not only that, in an interpretation of this particular part, it is very clearly held by our courts that these fundamental rights are extended to all the people who reside in India. Whether you have a right to vote or not is immaterial, but these are available to all those who live in India. It is something very interesting. But however, despite these being constitutionally available to citizens, they are not equally available to everybody. There are people to whom those deeds are not available. In India, and also in many other countries in the world, caste, patriarchy, and discrimination against third gender seem to have prevented people from accessing their natural rights, human rights, etc. If you look at the recent newspapers, there's something very interesting you'd notice. And that should open your eyes to this kind of marginalization. You know that in the Olympics, when our players participated, there's a particular group, the women's hockey team, which has performed very well. But then, towards the end of it, when they were fighting for the final stages of the competition, they failed. It is very, you know, easy in uh, Olympic. It happens, and the, you can get defeated in the semi-final. You can get defeated in the quarter-final. You know, this can happen. You can obviously get defeated in the final. That does not mean you are a bad team or you are a bad player, bad athlete. But what happened was, you remember that since the hockey team had a number of Dalit women in it particular sections in our society started trolling these people and started saying that we have lost because we had Dalits there. If we didn't have Dalits and if we had sent Brahmins, we would have won. As if the Brahmins are better athletes than any Dalit. Who is Chopra? You know him. Well, he is not much of a Brahmin. Very bad, very sad. Now, one should, but this is an attitude which very powerful sections of our country have. And that creates a situation which marginalizes the people who are the leads, who are untouchable, who are not upper caste Hindus. Very sad, but this is an unscientific attitude, but this is a very powerful attitude in our country. Now, therefore, one must, and the same thing is true about women. Very often, women are discriminated against and that is primarily because the society is patriarchal. See, there is now evidence, the ladies who are present here will be very happy about it. There is now evidence all over the world that women seem to be better teachers. There is no doubt about it. It has been proved repeatedly. And yet, when you sit in a selection committee in a college, a principal or two say, well, preferably I'll take a man. Other things being equal, he'll say that. Other things being equal, I'll prefer a man. But actually other things are not equal, even then you'll take a man. Ridiculous. But these are attitudes which discriminate against women because women is a weaker section, it's a marginalized section. 
third gender, of course, is virtually untouchable. You know that. And it took Supreme Court recently to emphasize that we should not discriminate against them. Now, when you look at the atrocities committed against various sections of people, you notice something very, very interesting. Atrocities against the SCs and the STs during 1919 and 20, uh, sorry, uh, 2019 and 2020 increased by 7.3% and 26.5% respectively. Those increase. And which are the states which were at the forefront of this increase? Uttar Pradesh has the most, the highest number of cases of crime against the elites who are scheduled castes. Madhya Pradesh had the highest number of cases of crime against Adivasis. And you know who rules these states. You know which is the most powerful social and political force in these states now. That creates a problem. That marginalizes a large section of our population. And the, if you look at the National Crime Record Bureau, which records crime, there's something very interesting you notice. There's quite a large number of cases of mob lynching. The NCRB did not release the data on such cases. NCRB uh, RB releases all data of crime every year. And particular, this particular crimes were committed against whom you know, who were lynched in the name of protecting cow, the Muslims, a minority group, one of the most marginalized in our country today. And the interesting thing, one of the government agencies, the National Crime Record Bureau, decided not to report these cases. And they said because the evidence which are there about these cases are vague. Who are they to decide whether they are vague or not? It's just court which will decide. But yet they did not uh, report this. There's a very interesting case. Many of you know this, but I would like to refresh your memory about this. I don't know how many of you would remember a man called Pehlu Khan. He was murdered by a mob in the name of Saving Cow, Guraksha. This is a striking example of discrimination against minorities. Why? Because despite a video evidence, and the dying man's declaration in law, when you investigate a crime, if a dying man makes a uh, statement that is accepted as unquestionable, because at the time of death, no one is going to tell a lie. This is the assumption. There was a dying man's, Pelu Khan's own declaration. He named his attackers. The perpetrators still roamed free in the country. And on the other hand, what did the police do? The police filed a case against the dead Pehlu Khan of stealing cow. <coughs> well, on, the, on October 30, uh, 2019, the High Court, Rajasthan High Court, had to quash this case. But one must understand what is happening, that the minorities of this country are also marginalized. But when we look at these marginalization, we should understand something. Over and above poverty and lack of education, discriminatory customary and cultural practices deprive some groups of being treated equally. You may be highly qualified but you belong to a group which is socially and culturally discriminated against or, or is considered uh, uh, unequal, considered lower in standard than you are discriminated against. So all over the world people have been saying that poor people are discriminated, educationally backward people are discriminated. It is not only that, 
there is a cultural discrimination which emerges because, because of tradition and cultural practices. When you look at scholars like David Harvey, a very important name in social sciences today, you find that he uses, term, uses the term marginalized communities. And, but when you look at the United Nations uh, reports, then you find something very, very interesting. That these reports or the conventions do not refer to communities as marginalized. They refer to whom? They refer to marginalized groups. There's a difference between marginalized groups and marginalized communities. See, only in rare occasions, a whole community is discriminated or marginalized. Some sections, even within marginalized communities, remain empowered. Let us take some names. All of you must be knowing Juram Thanga. You must be knowing Conrad Sangma. You must be knowing Spriti Irani. You will know Sonia Gandhi. Are they marginalized? You cannot call them marginalized. They are very powerful people. Yet each one of them belong to communities which are identified as marginalized communities. Women are considered marginalized communities. Tribals are considered marginalized communities. Now, what does it prove? It proves that there are exceptions in marginalized communities who may not be actually marginalized, who may be powerful. These exceptions may play a very major role in their respective communities in uplifting them, provided the community remains cohesive. If a community is cohesive, it is possible that these exceptions like Sonia Gandhi, Smriti Irani among women, or Jaram Thanga or Conrad Changma among scheduled tribes may play a very important role in uplifting their community, bringing them out, out of marginalization. It is possible if the community is cohesive. But if you look at the world, the cohesive communities are, have been generally affected by capitalism, globalization, individualism, and consumerism. These have actually dislocated identities of communities. And therefore, their cohesiveness is gone. Now, in 19th century, a person who was a tribal, he would normally take his own community along with him, or he would consider himself to be a part of that community. He is bound by the norms, or he was bound by the norms to the community. But today, when capitalism is in its late stage, late capitalism, when you have globalization, he does not feel lots of people who belong to tribal communities do not behave like tribals. Their friends are not among tribals. Their friends are, their friends are high and mighty, very powerful. Why? Because the cohesiveness of that community is no longer there as a result of the influence of globalization and capitalism. You pass IAS, you have left even your family behind and you have entered a different path, one must understand. You become a successful businessman, your friends are successful businessmen from other communities, from all communities, and you have left your community behind. You do not treat your community specially when you just move ahead in the social ladder from your general community. So we must understand this. Uh, so this is the problem of uh, working from home. My granddaughter, four-year-old, tried to peep into an 
try to show her face it will be easier so that you people can see her anyway uh the this idea but then people mostly believe that the communities are cohesive though they are today not cohesive and this idea of the cohesive community actually made india for pro, for providing protection to the marginalized communities how did we do it see the indian constitution in its article 154 this article was amended in 1951 itself and this clause 4 was added to it and this clause 4 said nothing in this article or in article 292 shall prevent the state from making any provisions for the adjustment of any socially economic and economically backward classes of citizens or scheduled caste and scheduled tribes which means that till then it was impossible to give protection specially to a particular community because that will become a discriminatory action you you are discriminating against others when you give special protection to a particular community but then people realize that maybe it is necessary to give protection and discriminate against the most powerful while trying to protect the marginalized sections or marginalized community this is the article which actually brought in the era of uh, reservation this article brought in the idea of reservation it started the era of reservations in assam i'm uh, sorry in india but 70 years of reservation has not ended marginalization of communities when you, you know in this part of india in north east it is slightly difficult to realize this because reservation here seems to have done quite good that will become very evident when i discuss some facts later on in this lecture but when you look at you uttar pradesh you look at south india you look at west india you will find that despite reservation certain sections like the dalits scheduled tribes of central india and even muslims remain absolutely marginalized reservation had given opportunity to some of them but the community as such could not rise above discrimination this is what one must understand the other thing that i would like to draw your attention to is that article 15 4 clause 4 does not mention minorities but minorities in this country are marginalized to one must understand even third gender is a margin marginalized section one must understand it's a minor minority group that way minority groups in this country remain marginalized but this article 15 clause 4 did not mention it it mentioned other things but not the uh minorities of the country when you look at the facts muslims below the poverty line what is the percentage of muslim in this country 31% of the muslims of the country according to government's own figure are below the poverty line now even the uh, uh, the for the for the average indian for the all over india for all communities what is the percentage of people below the poverty line is very interesting while among muslims it is 31.4 in the case a uh, 31 person in the case of the average all other communities put together the below poverty line figure is on the 6% of the population what is 6% what is 31% For the civil tribes, it is 24.1 percent. Remember, where illiteracy is concerned, you see the minority, the Muslims, are 
among them, 42.7% Muslims are illiterate. But even among the scheduled tribes, look at the Mizu. The Mizuram, do you know what is the illiterate percentage? 8.7%. In the case of Muslims, it is 42.7%. In the case of uh, Mizu tribe, it is only 8.7%. But Article uh, 15, Clause 4 did not look at the minorities. Do you know why? Because this is a, a democracy which is majoritarian. There are certain biases are there, and this also caused some amount of marginalization in our country. While some sections of the tribals have been able to reap benefits of reservation, the large majority of the tribes in central India, Dalits and Muslims all over the country have not been able to do that. And when you look at India's Northeast, Northeast scheduled tribes, they have made advances, there is no doubt about it. Now, over 90% uh, of the tribals in Mizoram are educated, literate. And if you look at the average standard of living of the tribals, the middle class tribals living standard is much better than other communities in this region because of reservations. I don't know how many of you know this. I, I have seen it very closely because I have served in Northeastern University of Shilog for long years, from 1985 to 2012. And I've seen it very closely. See, they, are, they don't have to pay income tax. Even the richest of the tribal do not pay income tax within their own area. And that itself is one third of your income. I have always seen this. While I pay 33% of my income as income tax in those days, at 25% now, my tribal colleagues did not have to pay anything. See, and these can give advantages to them, and therefore they have been able to become economically more empowered. There is no doubt about it. But when you look at Dalits, Muslims, well, they have not been able to take advantage of this. They are still deprived because other communities are powerful in their own areas. Distribution of power and cultural tradition of dominant communities affected, adversely affected the Dalits and uh, Muslims in our country. Therefore, the sum and substance of what I have been trying to tell you is that what you need is access to political power. Access to political power is the key to overcome marginalization of any community or any group. I prefer the word group, not only because the United Nations have done it, as I have explained, that there are sections within so-called quote-unquote marginalized communities in which People are empowered, they are not discriminated. There are, there are a whole lot of the large majority will be discriminated, but even then sections of them will be uh, empowered. And therefore, it is better to use the term marginalized groups than marginalized communities. And wherever these communities, marginalized communities have political power in their own area, they are, they are no longer marginalized. Now look at the communities, marginalized communities of India's Northeast. The hill tribes are a marginalized community. They are very backward, poor, illiterate. There is no doubt about that. If you look pre-1950 situation. And today, when they have had their own states, you can see their situation. But there is something else to it. When you give power, political power, to a marginalized community in a particular area, then even the non-marginalized communities, people living in that area get marginalized. This is true of most of the tribal uh, states and autonomous council areas of this region. You have seen the uh, fate of the Adivasis in the Borland area. Whole lot of them were murdered, houses burned, all that because the Borus had political power there. 
The same thing is true that other communities in the dominant uh, community uh, areas of the tribal states, the dominant tribal community creates marginalized situation or marginalizes other communities there. Uh, the Garus, for instance, in Meghalaya had faced it for a long time from the castes, which are the most dominant. So this creates a problem. Therefore, just access to political power, everybody in their own area, well, that may not be a solution to the problem of marginalization. But access to political power is dependent on resources like political consensus, level of mobilization. You, the uh, constitution might give you political power. But if you do not have political consensus within that marginalized group, that power will not be exercised by them. Moreover, if uh, you <coughs> do not have a level of mobilization among the community, if the community is not properly mobilized, it will not be able to exercise political power. In a book on student movement in Northeast India, I have said that the student movement of the tribals in this region, or for that matter, most of this region, had shown something very interesting. That, that participation, political participation in democratic process has increased as a result of these movements. So once you increase, once you have increased participation in democracy, then you obviously can overcome marginalization. There is no doubt about it. Now the human rights of the marginalized section therefore is not only a matter of constitutional guarantee. You cannot do it only by framing a law or passing an order. I keep saying it repeatedly that though many people do not really understand it, law merely regulates. What governs is politics. You can have a constitutional provision guaranteeing access to political power for marginalized community. But if the politics does not support that, that law will remain a law only. One must understand that. Society restricts human action more than the state. One of the most important person who has said this was Hannah Arendt in her book on totalitarianism. She has shown that yes, the state can control you, but the state cannot observe you all the time. There are times, but with the Pegasus, now things might be different. Even your bedroom will be known to the state if the state decides to do that. But otherwise, the state cannot constantly monitor you. But society can monitor you every moment because you are in society. So social restrictions can create problems, serious problems for uh, uh, communities, for accessing political power, and therefore uh, overcoming marginalization. Once politically empowered, even generally marginalized communities might marginalize others. That is another question we must uh, take. We must be careful about it. Therefore, I'm arguing that while it is true that the poor, the educationally backward people and minorities are people who are marginalized and their communities are marginalized, but there are only groups of them, since some of them are empowered within those communities. Therefore, I would call that what you have is marginalized groups. The second is that deprivation of political power makes it possible, marginalization. And the third, that it is society, which social practices, tradition, which uh, affects communities more than the state, the law, the constitution itself. Uh, with that, I'll close, and if there are questions, I would like to answer. Thank you. Thank you for listening to me, but if there are questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, thank, thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for this enlightening uh, speech that you have just delivered. Uh, I would now proceed uh, for the question and answer uh, session. Uh, any participants wanting to ask any questions are welcome. 
I just saw a message popping asking for your email ID, sir. I uh, the person was asking about your email ID, a participant. So, uh, unless any other questions in the pop box, uh, or so your mic is muted, sir. So kind, uh, could you please kindly unmute your mic, sir? I said that email ID is already available with the. And I'm very happy if people email me and ask questions. Yeah. Sure, sir. Sure, sir. Any, any questions on behalf of the participants is highly welcomed. Well, no questions can mean only two things. Number one, right. everything, I said, huh? everything I said was right. No, it cannot be. I don't believe in that. The second is everything I said went right, above three feet the head of the participants. But that also I don't believe. The third is oh, that we are generally very timid. I welcome criticism and question. And I respect only those who criticize me. Those who keep on saying yes, sir. Well, I am not very respectful of them. That's all. Hello. Thank you. All the participants.